James 8.13. Now, if we say, all the important people are here, and this juncture is really little channel walks in. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, first of all, just a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Uh, yesterday in the questions, somebody really, really, really asked if we could do a guided meditation. And the reason I said no, oh, because it did break up my afternoon, uh, you know, two to three, and then uh, four to five for the Sutta class. So what I suggest, I'm just talking with Venerable Chandra about it, is maybe to do a guided meditation from three to 3.45 and then have a 15 minute break and then we can do the Sutta class. So if people want to meditate just uh, after lunch, this hall is nice and peaceful until 3 o'clock. You know that for you know, two hours it will be uh, more uh, noisy. Not really noisy, but just your guided meditation followed by Sutta class. Is that making okay for everybody? Okay, excellent, very good. And the other thing is that you know, sometimes we try and keep uh, silence here, but obviously just teaching and organising the retreat, sometimes it's not only, oh, what's the name of the end there? Uh, so, so, yeah. so uh, has to uh, talk, but also I have to talk with them on channel about you know, how things are going. So what I usually try and do is to go, especially for the breakfast, a little bit earlier. So we usually go about five past seven, or seven o'clock. But please, don't think, oh, the teachers are in the breakfast hall, so we must always follow the example of our <laughs> teacher. <laughs> <laughs> so please stay here around ten minutes if you could, until the bell goes. And then, once the bell goes, just like in the horse races, and then they're off <laughs> for the breakfast. <laughs> If they take it, carving and moment and stuff. Because otherwise, uh, because you know, we have to talk about things like uh, the guided meditation times, that sometimes it's, that you see us talk, you think that's an invitation for everyone else to talk. So please, come a little bit later. It's only five or ten minutes. There's plenty of breakfast left. So, anyway. Sure, <laughs> sure. <laughs> So anyway, that's just a bit of housekeeping. And so for now, for this is the, uh, the, the talk, and what I wanted to especially mention this morning, again, to go a little bit deeper into the meditation, and before we have time to remember to talk a little bit about the walking meditation too. Already I've mentioned about the natural path to stillness that when you do things, it tends to disturb the mind. And I gave one of our John Charles similes of waving the hand, and uh, that's going to, uh, the, what the, the waving of the hand represents a leaf on a tree. It's only moving because something outside of it is making it move, the wind. The nature, the default position of a leaf on a tree is to be still. Same as your mind. If you can only leave it alone, it becomes perfectly still. And there was another simile which is um, <coughs> strange about there's some people in this retreat who have come for the first time, some people who have been meditating for a long time. It doesn't really make any difference. Because I was only in my first couple of months in Ajahn Charles Monastery Wat Bang Hong. That must have been about in the 7, 74, 75. And I remember this simile, but I thought it was the most crazy, stupid simile, made no sense at all to me, and I thought I'd forgotten it. I wasn't ready for it. But the amazing thing is that these similes and stories are sometimes so profound, they lodge somewhere in your memory, just waiting for the time they're relevant, and then they just pop up, similar to in the middle of Australia, it's very dry, in the deserts, and there are many seeds which are waiting, sometimes for years, and when the rains come, 
and they germinate in the centre of Australia, which is just a mass of flowers. They just wait there and wait until the right time. It's the same with many of these anecdotes and stories. But this particular one, I only remembered it years later. And there was Ajahn Chah saying that his monastery was a mango orchard. And the mangoes were planted by the Buddha. And each tree had loads and loads of sweet, ripe, juicy mangoes. And straight away I thought that Ajahn Chah had lost it. But no mango trees in what up on there. And if they weren't planted, the Buddha never came to Thailand, I'm sorry. And also, if he did plant any mango trees, they'd be dead by now. A mango tree doesn't have that long a lifespan. It was a metaphor, he was saying. And he carried on. He said, those mangoes are ripe. And incredibly sweet and juicy. But there's only one way to get those mangoes. If you climb the tree, you'll never reach them. If you get a ladder, the ladder will never reach. If you throw things at the mango, trying to hit them to make them fall, you'll always miss. And if you shake the tree, the mangoes will never fall. There's only one way to get the mangoes from the trees parted by the Buddha. And that is to sit perfectly still under the mango tree and hold out your hand and a man will fall. Have you ever seen a mango tree or an apple tree or something? Have you ever tried that? <laughs> no one had to wait a long, 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 long time. And if the mango did fall, it's more likely, knowing our luck, to fall on your head rather than in your hand. That's flat. What on earth did Ajahn Chah mean? I thought it just made no sense at all. It's only later, after so much struggle and striving, trying to climb the Bodhi tree, trying to throw things at it to get the fruits of the path, trying to jump up and reach it, while last he's shaking the hell out of that Bodhi tree, trying to make something fall. And nothing ever did. And then sometimes, just out of luck, or out of frustration, or just what the heck, I'm just going to sit here and relax. You put your hand out, which was compassion, and a man who fell. Where did that come from? You remember the story which Ajahn Chah told. Stillness and opening your heart, kindness. Those two are what make the mango fall. You strive, you struggle, you try and climb the mango tree, you never get a mango. So, let's look at that simile in more detail using another, much more well-known simile from Buddhism. And that is the simile which is more well known from Maitriyana, Om Mani Padme Hum, which every Buddhist seems to know much more than Namotasa. But nevertheless, what does it mean? The Om and the Hum on either side are just uh, respectful greetings. It's like a Namo, it doesn't have really any meaning except for what's in between that is supposed to be very holy, very revered. And the two words, the key words in the middle, Mani Padme, which is the jewel in the heart of the lotus. So basically, revering, respecting the incredible jewel in the heart of the lotus. So now I'll explain, explain the Theravada monks understanding of what that means. You are the lotus, and the jewel inside of you is obviously Nibbana. How to get to that jewel 
inside each one of you right now. You try and dissect that lotus with a knife, a scalpel, smash it to bits, to bits, uh, blow it up to try and get to the middle. You never get to the heart of the lotus that way. It seems to be only one way to get to that jewel in the heart of the lotus. Look at a lotus. It's closed up at night time. And on the outside of the lotus, when it's closed up, the outermost sheath of petals is coarse, rough, no fragrance, no much colour, and quite unpromising. It's dirty, it's dusty. But you all know if you know lotuses, that inside the lotus is the most beautiful fragrant petals. So, a little story about this, a story within a story. One of the retreats I gave about three years ago, the retreat center in opposite my monastery, China Grove. It's uh, only about six kilometers from a prison. It's an open prison. And one day, a gentleman came to register for the retreat. And I just be happened to be next to the desk where the person was taking the registrations. He was big, scruffy, full of tattoos. And I thought, I've never seen you before. Are you sure you're in the right place? The prison is just up the road. <laughs> He was the last person you'd expect, you know, by, you know, you know, we all do it, and I'm very guilty of this, of just judging a person by their appearances straight away. And he said, no, I'm on the list. And I looked, he was on the list, I've never seen him before. Okay, have a go, see what happens. Rough, tattooed, you know, tough looking. And then during the retreat, when he had the interviews, you know, he wanted to have a personal one, he told me that he had his experiences in meditation. And as he related those experiences, my eyes went wide. I said, that was a journey you had. That was the last person I never expected on the whole retreat, simply because of his appearance. And I'm very tough. If you come and ask me was that a jhana or not, I'm one of the toughest examiners. Mm -hmm. Somebody showed me a book about you know, samadhi and jhanas, which was going around. And the person who wrote the book was uh, ranking the different teachers of jhana in the world who was the toughest to acknowledge that what you achieved was actually a jhana. Number two, the number five was Maya um, <coughs> Kema. Um, number two was Tompa Usayano. No, no, not Tompa, no. Park Usayano, yes. And the hardest, the toughest, the one you had to jump the highest bar was Ajahn Brahma. So I recognize, if you come to me and say you had an experience, if I say that, yeah, okay, I can call that was a jhana, then everyone else will. And sometimes I'm tough. If you come to me and you say you've had an experience, and I say, no, go to another one, say, oh yeah. <laughs> I have the highest standards. <laughs> well, I like to keep those high standards too, to make sure. Otherwise, you'd get into spiritual materials. But that fellow did. Very clear. And so I was amazed. And I used his example of the lotus. His was a very rough and coarse lotus on the outside. All closed up. When it opened up, my goodness, beauty and fragrance and amazing petals deep within that gentleman was, was blew my mind. If he can have that, each one of you can. So, it gives us confidence that you can do it. It doesn't matter who you are. 
what gender, what race, uh, disabilities, mental impairments, don't like calling impairments. You can, age. It's in there. You just have to know how to open it up. So how do you open up a lotus? As I said, in the morning, it's all closed up. First rays of the sun in the morning hit the outermost petals. The light and the warmth of the sun hit those petals and the petals start to open. When those outermost rough sheath of petals opens up, it allows the next layer of petals to receive the light and the warmth of the sun. So that too could open up, allowing the light and the warmth of the sun to strike the next layer of petals. One by one, they open up. And once opened up, the next layer can receive the warmth and light. So it too can open up. And as you go deeper and deeper and deeper into the lotus, the petals become more refined, more thin and delicate. And the fragrance, the perfume becomes more overpowering. And the colours more and more beautiful as you go deeper into the lotus. But all the time, all one needs is to have the warmth and light of the sun. What that simile means for meditation is when you sit down and close your eyes, you have this rough, um, weathered, old lotus sheath called your body. And sometimes you look at bodies, they can be old, they can be deformed, they can be stigmatized, they can have so much history in protecting what's inside that you think that no way can this hold something so precious and so beautiful. But you just sit here. The light and the warmth of the sun stand for the mindfulness and the kindness which you shine as it were on your body. You're aware of your body, how's it sit here? And you're kind to it. Please be kind to your body. If you need to scratch something, as long as it's on your body, <laughs> One of the reasons why we meditate with our eyes closed, it's only one of the benefits, because when you all got your eyes closed, then... <laughs> <laughs> No one is meant to see it. Unfortunately, I've got a camera on me all the time. <laughs> but you can be kind to yourself, for goodness sake. And when you're kind to yourself, your body in particular, then you find your body relaxes. When it relaxes, you're aware of the body, as I've been teaching, making sure. Is that comfortable? That's comfortable. Is everything okay? The body's my robe a bit too tight. Just an off a little bit. Sitting comfortably enough. <sighs> Do you need a glass of water? You take a glass of water. You're kind to your body. Then your body relaxes. Sometimes the relaxing of your body can be so delightful that we never call retreat centers where I am the leader. We never call them my like meditation camps or concentration camps. We have another title for them. We call this particular one Club Med Belsey Bridge. 
and club med stands for club meditation. <laughs> and when we call it club med instead of the concentration camp, that means that you know it changes your atmosphere, your attitude. This is about relaxation and happiness and deep joy and happiness going in. I, just, <laughs> I started the club med. Uh, labelling and marketing for meditation retreats. Because you know the one fellow once said he was on a retreat so many years ago, and every time he went in to the meditation hall, you know, he dubbed it the torture chamber. Now he had to go in there because he thought that's only going to get light, come on, another hour. Knees not being able to move, having to do this and do that. It was torture, it was something totally, totally wrong if meditation and the meditation hall was uh, considered to be like a torture chamber. It's not a torture chamber. Many of you know the main type of meditation, the best meditation is called Anapanasati. I wrote through the whole of the sutras, Vinaya commentaries, the Buddha never ever taught Anapanasati. Anna means along with, Hana is the breath, Sati means mindfulness. Mindfulness along with the breath, not mindfulness along with pain. Anna, pain is Sati. I don't know why people think that they're going to get somewhere that way. And we've tried, if you like, but that was the first thing which the Buddha tried before he got smart to become enlightened. But when we set his system. So anyway, instead, just we call it covenant. We relax the body. It feels good. Uh, one of my friends, he's a professor now at uh, Stanford University, uh, Professor Philip Golden. And he did an experiment once which only a university like Stanford could get funding for. He got some of his psychology students, split them into two groups, you know, for a uh, comparison. He said one of those groups to a meditation retreat for the day. He sent the other group to a California spa for the day. In a California spa, apparently, you have massages, deep massages, and just warm oil pour down your back, and just soaking in a nice hot tub. Uh, all expenses paid, California Spa, paid for by Stanford University, or the retreat. <laughs> if that was, <laughs> what would you think? Oh, I'm going to go to the retreat, thank you. But anyway, they were just chosen at random. And at the end of the day, they were given a, a standard test to see, you now obviously beforehand, just you know, their psychological a peace of mind, relaxation, lack of tension. And at the end of the day, they see which group had benefited the most. And it was amazing, it was a very, very clear result. Those who went to the spa were far more relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> what type of meditation were these people doing? And if they did, a similar research on one of my retreats, I'd be very, very disappointed if I didn't beat the California spa, hands down. To learn how to relax much deeper than the spa. So, we start with my body, relaxing it to the max. And even that has huge benefits just even today, um, uh, I was uh, remembering this article about food poisoning. And I recalled one event when I had very bad food poisoning. Being a monk, when people offer us food, we don't know sometimes what we're eating or what the ingredients are. And so sometimes it may be something which has you know, gone off or just a 
soup our tummies. So often we get an indigestion. It's, I call it an occupational hazard. But on, on this occasion, it was very strong food poisoning. I live in a cave. I was in my cave. And every, and I knew there was something wrong with my stomach, my tummy, because every few seconds, ah! <laughs> as my stomach cramped up, and I just couldn't help, ah! And I like using this method whenever I'm giving a talk and people are falling, ah! falling asleep. <laughs> a bit of drama <laughs> wakes people up and grabs their attention. <laughs> ah! <laughs> it was real, I was you know, screaming because it's painful. And then of course when you realise there's a problem there. Being a monk who lives in a forest a reasonable distance, at least you know, 30 minutes from the nearest ambulance, and that's the one you actually call them. I had to, you know, would have to crawl down to the uh, the office, you know, to, to get the telephone. So oh, I don't need to call and all that <coughs> messing around. So instead, we do a standard procedure: mindfulness on the pain, that cramping, that contraction of your intestines. Really pushing it in so you get a huge pain, an overreaction of the immune system. I just was aware of it. When you have awareness, you can actually mess around with what you're aware of. Let it go. Open the door of your heart to that agony. And just those sorts of attitudes, no fear, but openness. You could feel the pain intensity, just get a slight bit, maybe one percent less. I was going in the right direction. Another one percent less. Another one percent less. Little bug until you could relax the intestines. Relax as the screams got less intense. The pain became endurable. Pain became just a little irritation. I remember at the time, I was surprised, even though you've done it before, just how easy and quick it was. 20 minutes, and there was no ache or pain, not even an irritation left. The whole of the food poisoning, which was real, when you're screaming in your cave, rising, this is not imaginary. It had all gone. We could meditate with a perfectly healthy feeling gut. And often I wonder what could have happened? Because these were bacteria. Bacteria running riot in your in your intestines. And I imagined, as you know, my character does. The little bacteria, the last time I saw a bacteria and saw a microscope, it was like a blob with all these little tentacles coming out. That's how I remember them. And I, mem and I imagined all these little blobs, these bacteria, which were causing problems. All instead of causing problems were all sitting peacefully with their tentacles crossed. <laughs> <laughs> Meditating. <laughs> Which is why they weren't causing any problems. I don't know, but it works. The way you're aware of your body, it's amazing what you can relax. And you get a huge amount of different ways of dealing with your health. So, your body becomes really relaxed. And like a California spa, I think that you feel just, oh, this is very nice. The delight of your relaxed body. The delight is important to notice because later on it really leads into very powerful meditations. When you enjoy what you're aware of, it sticks to you and you stick to it. The mind doesn't wander. 
when you have your fun. So, body is nice and relaxed. But even if you don't choose to look at your mind, that's what happens. The body sheath opens out and you go inside. You go inside quite naturally. After all, you're not really aware of your body. Just aware of this mind. And the first layer of these many, many petals which make up your mind is time past and future, as far back as you can remember, as long into the future as you can fantasize and dream and fear. That's called time. And after a while, quite naturally, when you enjoy this moment, even enjoy the body, you come into the present moment, you go into the middle of time. You're going in. So there is the layer of the mind, and you open up, you're in the present moment. Just that much, being in the present moment, there's so much beauty just being here. Instead of looking for happiness, joy, fulfillment, enlightenment, somewhere else, just like the simile of the old Mark Stone life, shooting the arrow over there, trying to find fulfillment, trying to find inner wealth, by shooting the arrow all over the place. We let it pop. Let it fly and falls right where we are. Just be here. Even though sometimes you may be in pain and die, everything may be falling apart in your life. Right now, right here, nothing to do. Here has already arrived. It can't be changed. It can only be impressed. You have no work to do. It's already come. So, that's why becoming in the present moment is a beautiful place to rest. The only place to rest. And again, people who feel it's being irresponsible, not doing anything, not solving problems, not well, fulfilling unfinished business. <coughs> What's that is finished. In the present moment, is often the best thing you can ever do for your future. Your future is being made right in this moment. If you're very peaceful now, you have wonderful memories of this retreat. Not only your future is being made, so is your past. This is the only time you can do anything for these two. Yeah. So after a while, how stupidly We've been trying to make a good future by planning it, rather than being in life with our habits. The great Scouser philosophy, philosopher John Lennon, <laughs> life is what happens when you're busy planning something else. So, in the present moment, we're already in a very deep and beautiful layer of petals. How do we get there? Just being aware and being kind to this moment. At first, this moment might not be the best. You may have an itchy throat or be tired, be jet lagged, be hungry because you didn't eat enough food. Just but be kind to this moment. And you find if you're kind to this moment, if you smile at it, this moment smiles back. Whatever you're kind to, then just show you its beautiful side. side. Whatever you're angry at, shows you its wrong side. So, so many times in life, even, I would mention about the, the ATM machine, even if you're kind to so the machines, I don't know how this happens, it boggles my mind sometimes. Because I was I used to have a uh, uh, cement mix. I was the main builder when I was starting monasteries over in Australia. I had a cement mixer. Sometimes no one else would get it to work. 
And I'd go up to him and just, I would, I would stroke it. Okay, come on, it's okay. And I'd pull it, and the first time it would work. He would, he would, when I went to Oslo a few years ago, I was just waiting and waiting because one of the boom gates had gone down. And he paid the parking fee at Oslo Airport, but you know, you couldn't get the sort of machine to work. So I went over to the machine and just thought, oh, there we go, it doesn't matter, I stroked him. <laughs> <laughs> I think I created many Buddhists in that line because as soon as they did press the button, they opened the first time. It's not sort of psychic stuff, it's just the power of kindness. It really works sometimes. Actually, most times. So, remember yesterday or something, we had this thing over here that was cracking. Did you see it just. There go. And it stopped. <laughs> it's a little bit of kindness. It's amazing just how powerful that is. So, when you're kind to this moment, this moment becomes very pleasant. It starts off with the present moment and transforms into the pleasant moment of awareness. So you're just here. And if you enjoy this moment, you don't need to give it names. You don't need to think. All thinking is a sign of discontent, unhappy, not at ease with what's occurring right now. Why on earth do you need to say anything about it? Standard little technique to prove how wonderful science is how beautiful and how easy. Please be mindful as I am speaking of what's going on between your ears. Because as I am speaking, you will begin to notice the pauses the spaces between my words. In those gaps, there were no words going on in your head. To be aware of the hum of the heat. Aware of the feelings in the body without giving things a name. Silence is very sacred. But sometimes people are afraid of silence. Over, oh, instead of talking about Australia, one of the first times I came, because I was born in England, a long day over in Thailand, but one of the first times I came back to the UK, <coughs> just purchased Chitlis Monastery in Sussex, maybe a few months. And I came home to Australia, to London to visit. I went to stay down in Chitlis. Hadn't got the air conditioning, not the air conditioning, hadn't got the, the central heating installed yet. Out in Orlando, was trying to get everything together. It happened to be one of the coldest winters. Remember somebody gave me, they still had the Daily Mirror there. And they showed the headlines. And the headlines in this newspaper to show what's really important in the UK. Minus 26 degrees centigrade. Even the beer froze. <laughs> I remember that headline. More concerned about the beer <laughs> with international affairs or the economy. Anyway. So because I was a visitor. I had no duties. So, after the, the breakfast, I went out into Chitlis Wood for a walk. Maybe it warmed up a little bit, maybe only minus 20. The snow was thick. 
no cars on the roads, no birds in the sky, not even any aircraft to be seen because Heathrow must have been closed down because of the heavy snowfall. And no human being was out at that time of the morning. As the old saying goes, only mad monks and Englishmen go out in temperatures like that. <laughs> and I haven't been both. But I can never forget that experience. There was no sound at all in the forest. All the birds, the animals, the squirrels, the rabbits were all hibernating, fast asleep in their, their little hollows in the trees on deep underground in their bones. All the birds were nesting. All the humans were in their little cottages under the duvets or in front of fires. No cars were looking, no bicycles, nothing was there. When I stopped walking, and the whole world stopped, the whole universe was absolutely silent. When I walked, the crunch of the snow under my boots was all that I could hear. When I stopped, I stopped. It was beautiful. Freezing, but beautiful. It was worth it. Silence is an amazing experience. So you go inside, you are silent. Can't do anything. And that is spiritual, beautiful, holy, I don't know what else words you can call it, but that much is incredibly delightful. And so you've gone inside time, deep to silence. Deeper you go into these petals, the more amazing it becomes. They just silent, just here, not moving. And then what comes up? The breathing. I always wondered why they always say the breathing is the most common form of meditation. And after a while it's obvious. Everything else disappears. It's the only thing left which is moving. And your brain, with it your mind, can only notice things which move. And that is one of those experiences which I got at Fossil Hall, as well as you know, just Realising using a stick only makes you afraid and how to make the best custard in the world. And they never got better custard than that. But <laughs> what I did remember also was in the Zen meditative tradition you had to sit with your eyes open facing a whitewashed wall. And one of the nice things about being in the, that time of my life, I was adventurous, willing to try anything once, see what happens. So I just sat there for half an hour now, eyes open, just watching the wall. And I was given no instructions what you're supposed to do, just watch. And because I'd already done enough meditation to get in the present moment, be silent, let go of the commentary, really still, watching the whitewash wall. And then the whole wall vanished. It disappeared. It wasn't there anymore. Which was weird. But in those 60s, weird was cool. <laughs> you say, you weren't afraid. You weren't thinking, my goodness, what's happening? Someone's put some drugs in the custard. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, once you have experiences, Afterwards, when you let them enjoy them enough, of course you explore them, contemplate them. Why? Oh, it's so obvious. When you close your eyelids, you can see the inside of your eyelids for maybe a couple of seconds. And because the image does not change, it vanishes, it disappears. The sense of sight shuts down. 
This was one of the first times the sensor sight shut down when my eyelids were open and I was aware of watching something. See, what I was watching was changing. That's why it disappears. The sound of that fan heater, after a while, will disappear because it doesn't change. It's ambient sound. Feelings in your body, hot, cold, after a while, it disappears. The taste of the saliva in your mouth, it disappears. Because your brain, very efficient, only notices change. So, when you're just sitting there in the present moment in silence, the only thing which is not changing, actually there's two things, is the, the, the beat of your heart, but we don't really pay as much attention to that ever in our ordinary life as we do to our breath. So just, you notice your breathing, there's anything left to watch. Just breathing in, breathing out. And you don't even concern yourself where that is occurring, because you don't choose. It comes to you, and everything else falls away. That's all that's left, just breathing. And you're going into that layer of petals, just the breath. Time has disappeared, silence. The body has disappeared. And inside that silence, you have the breath. And if it's that breath which you uh, can uh, arouse, it's always very delightful, very beautiful, very soft. Just watching the breath come in, watching the breath go out. You aren't doing anything, you're just watching, aware and kind. And nothing else. If it's not kindness, you're always trying to, to change it. To manipulate, it's not long enough, it's too short, it's too rough. Careful, and it's wonderful as it is. Don't try and change it to what it should be. You're kind and embrace it as it is. So when you open the door of your heart to this place, it's in and out. But you're not trying to use it for some ultimate purpose. I'm going to watch the breath so I can go to the next stage exploiting your way up, you know, the spiritual uh, greasy ladder, mm -hmm. you know, to try and get to the top to see what's there. No exploit things. Stay with them. Become a friend to them. And the longer you stay with this breath, the more refined and beautiful it gets. But not moving so fast. Delight comes. The other simile. If any of you ever go to the monastery which I live, Bodhidharma Monastery, in Serpentine, just south of Perth, we purchased the land for that monastery 36 years ago now. Right? And just it's on top of a hill, not much of a hill, but we wanted to choose a forest on top of a hill because we were forest monks and there was a tradition in the West that all holy men and holy women live on top of hills, on mountains actually. If you look for a holy man, you have to find a mountain somewhere. That's tradition. You never find a holy man living in a swamp, I always thought, until somebody said there is an exception and he's called Yoda who lives in the swamp, but that's, <laughs> that's Hollywood, that's not real life. So, on top of a hill is where we built our monastery, 2.2 kilometers from the bottom to the top. And it was about seven years, I'd be always in a car, in a truck, or some vehicle, up and down that hill, usually taking building materials, going to appointments, giving talks, one day, a beautiful morning, I asked my driver, please let me out here. I want to walk up the hill this morning. Plenty of time. And of course, sometimes they say, no, we'll take you. Say, no, I want to walk. It's amazing. You know, sometimes I try to take exercise. You know what happens? I have an argument. 
Well, no, we may, we need to make good karma, get in our car. Mm. That happens. It'd be ridiculous. But anyway, I stood my ground, got out of the car, and walked. While he went up ahead. And this is where amazing things happen. I was really peaceful and happy, beautiful morning. And as I walked up this road, which I've been travelling up and down in, in a vehicle for about seven years, maybe three or four times a, a week. It was like walking up that hillside for the very first time in my life. I just could not recognise my surroundings. And that was weird. You know, again, one of these strange experiences. What is going on? This is where you live, and you don't remember you know, the hillside? Because I was seeing far more detail. And what I was seeing was you know, more intense, more delightful. Oh, I stopped, stood, and stared. And when I stopped, I saw things I never ever expected to see in my own side. Just so many thousands of individual blades of grass, each a different colour. Just so much glowing, how much fluorescing in the sunshine. You see the bottom of the hillside there was a little creek with flowing water, like a bubbling brook, if you like. And how could I miss that for so many years? And the trees, all of different twisted shapes, and then little bark, all sort of broken up into pieces, it's called tessellated bark. And just looking at all of it, it was delightful. How had I missed that? for seven years. And then of course you contemplate just basic science. When you look at something with your eyes, there's a chemical reaction on your retina. But for most of the time, before that even fully forms, another image comes in, and then another image, and then another image. No image has enough time to complete its formation. So you just see washed out images, smudge, the detail not clear. That is real life, as we live it, rushing from place to place. Not really seeing anything completely, before we go on to something else. But when you start going slower, every image has more time to form. The details are just more <laughs> Uh, rich. And then when you stand perfectly still, the image has all the time it really needs to fully form. <coughs> and what you see there is something you never expected. So much detail, so much information, and even the colours are no longer like pastel, not washed out, they're rich fully formed, and that's just with sight, and the wind, the breeze, it's like incredibly sensuous, especially for a month, it just brushes past your, your face, <coughs> you have all the time in the world to experience it, it's full, delightful, inexpensive, simply because you're going to slow. When it comes to insight, we move too fast to really see anything properly. The slower we go, naturally, the more time we have, the richer and more detailed is the world outside as well as the world inside. And more beautiful and delightful than you've ever expected. So it does happen. You go outside and see a little flower in the garden and you can't move from it. Wow, how beautiful. How come I never saw that before? Why is it too fast? So, kindness and awareness. You see this beautiful breath. People say, what do you mean, delightful breath? Breath is just a breath. Yeah, you know, a nice meal. A beautiful, like the frost outside, it was delightful to see this morning, or a sunset, those are delightful. 
a rap, the rifle. Come on, get a laugh. Well, it is. So you may have a wonderful time with your breath. Before I go deeper into the lunches to see what happens next, that will probably be tomorrow on this talk, I want you to say something also about the walking meditation, which is the same. You start in a walking meditation room, which is, what's the room, see? Suffolk Hall. Again, take the shorter sides, and you know, don't walk diagonally from one corner to the other corner, which means no one else can use that. <laughs> you start at one end, you just walk. Natural pace. Or well, at least what the body feels is natural. Your eyes two feet in front of you. Well, not two foot, sorry. Um, two meters in front of you. Just the body length in front of you. Eyes open. Well, they need not looking to the left or the right, up or down. It's about a body length in front of you. Just to make sure you don't step on anything which might injure you, or even stop in time so you don't hit your head on the wall. So it just gives you a sense of safety. You just walk with awareness and kindness. And as you walk, you're aware of your feet moving. What part of your sole of your foot leaves the ground first? What last? Notice as many muscles which are moving to allow you to do this incredibly complicated manoeuvre of walking. And with your foot, say you start with the left foot, does it go straight up? Or does it go forward a bit? Or mine goes back a bit? It's not, not a straight line, it just, the statement of habits, it curves at the end. And when it goes forward, does it go horizontally? Mine goes up and down like a parabola. Where it reaches the end, and then it goes down on the ground. What part of your foot meets the ground first? What does it feel like when it touches that the carpet, or the wood, or the coal? What's that like? The sensual feeling of skin touching carpet. It becomes delightful, interesting, consuming. The only reason why people start walking slowly is because there's too much going on to walk fast. There's too many sensations, there's too much of interest happens and you do really go into that experience of walking. Present moment awareness, just the feelings happening now, silence, because you can't give these things a name. Foot feeling. Is that really good? We haven't developed an anguish for all the thousands of sensations which happen when we walk. We go into silence. And we go into the delightful step. It's really fun, joyful. You're not forcing it, it becomes amazing just how many sensations and movements in your muscles and the balance change in your body and especially when my feet just you know, reach the floor please take your socks off when you're doing walking meditation don't care how sweaty your feet are after a while that's gorgeous <laughs> just walk and feel and then you get into this delightful walking my personal story is first year as a monk in monastery in Bangkok. I do an hour's walking meditation in the main hall every morning. And I knew it was an hour because I don't know why they do this, but they had a big grandfather clock in the main meditation hall in what's the camp in the Bangkok. So every 15 minutes, ding dong, ding dong, ding dong, ding dong. It was terrible for if you're doing some sitting meditation. But when you're doing walking meditation, at least you know how many minutes have gone past. And I think it was you know, maybe about 14 minutes have gone past. I was, you know, it took me 30 minutes to get from one end to the other, and 30 minutes to come back again. I wasn't 
pruning and it's dead, it's just it's the fastest I could go. And then I was just noticing the next step. Wow, amazing, just how many movements are necessary just to lift a foot and they were just, oh, just so delightful. And then I heard a sound as if from the distance. That was the full name from the Right at 100 miles away. Then I realised there was another monk shouting in my ear hole, that far away. <laughs> I forgot I had to go to an appointment, to a, a, cer a ceremony. I forgot all about it. And he was sent by the head monk, the abbot, to come and get me. <laughs> he was right in my ear. And to me it was like a thousand miles away. And I realised I forgot and I had to do something. So I stopped walking and I was turning my head towards him to recognise his presence. It's amazing how many sensations just to move your head from just looking straight ahead to looking around him. I couldn't move fast, there's too much going on. And every movement of your neck was just a miracle. And I took about five or ten minutes before I had eye contact. <laughs> and I remember me saying, Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> and I was not being disrespectful, I just couldn't move fast. And that's what happens when you get into nice meditation, just enjoying it so much. Yes, it's attached, but it's good attachment. And they all knew what was going on because of the monastery, and they were all done. So they gave me the time to get out of meditation and just to actually to wind up again. So you can actually you know, walk properly. So that's what happens when you're meditating as well. So just really enjoy it. It's the same thing. This particular case, you're just focusing on moving. Which means that you don't have aches and pains in the knees. Or you know, the body is moving gently, so good for your um, circulation. And you walk there from one end to the other. When you get to the end, Turn around. Amazing, it's what you happen just to turn around. All the balancing and the movement. Just like when you first learned to walk as a kid. I was a dancer, you were so aware of all the muscles. You turn around and walk back again. What a wonderful time. And the extra benefit of walking meditation is the insight. Which you start at one end, you go to the other you come back again. You end up precisely where you started. Welcome to life. You don't get anywhere. Sadhu! 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 That's how you get nowhere, is it? Okay, so now we're going to... Uh, it's your time now to have uh, some more meditation or try walking meditation. And uh, afterwards we uh, we have 9.45, isn't it? 10 o'clock in a break and we have the interviews there. Sorry? In the ditching room. That sounds exotic. <laughs> <laughs> in the ditch. Okay, so see then, time to have uh, some water, cup of tea, or break the time. The rest of the time, have a wonderful morning, if you wish.